Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship, which is like a box of donuts. You never know what you're going to get. Or a box of chocolates. Praise the Lord. Um, is there a Joseph de Jesus here today? Joseph? Joseph de Jesus? Are you Joseph de Jesus? Joseph, you are the newest member of Grace Bible Fellowship. So if you feel like you never won anything in your life, you're stuck with us. I also heard a really corny dad joke. I have to tell it. Because it's St. Patty's Day coming up, and what's Irish and sits on your patio for six months? <laughs> she heard that one already. So. It's patio furniture. <laughs> so I. Patio furniture, yes, patio. Okay, so enough of that. Now that I've captured your attention and alienated the rest of you. Interesting story about St. Patrick, how he was kidnapped. You know, he wasn't even Irish. It's interesting. So he, he's kind of like an American. He was actually kidnapped while he was in a Roman colony, uh, which was Britain at the time. And he was taken away and made a slave until he was 22. He had the opportunity to escape. He had grown up with a grandfather who was a pastor, a father who was a deacon and a businessman. And he grew up in a Christian family and yet had never known Christ, never understood him until he was taken as a captive and he was, lived a life of slavery. And he lived in squalor with barely having enough to eat to stay alive, he began to cry out to God, cry out in the God that he had always heard about but never knew, and came to know Jesus Christ. And when he was 22 years old, he ended up escaping, jumping in a boat and coming back to Britain. Then going through education, he had a burden for the pagan people of Ireland and went back and shared the gospel. So that's the real story of St. Patrick. So all of the greenery and the patio furniture <laughs> aside. A great man of God who had a heart for souls, even the Druids and the people that uh, held him captive and abused him, he wanted to go back and share Christ with. What a great example for us to have a heart for the lost. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this great and glorious day. We thank you for the sun that comes out and melts the frost. We thank you for how you, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts and melt our cold hearts. I pray that you might help us today as we look into your word, that we might set our hearts on you, that we might remember you in all of the chaos and the craziness of our life, that you might again sit on the throne of our hearts and reign supreme. Help us, Lord, as we go through your word, that you might apply it to our hearts and minds, that we might be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're back in the book of Luke today. And since I didn't finish last week's message, I'm going to try to finish it this week. So I'm going to go really fast. If I go too fast, just raise your hand and say, oh, can you do that? Oh, no hands raised. Okay. Ho! Oh, can you do it? Can you do it? Ho! Oh, oh, Ho! Okay, good. That way I know, because when I'm up here, I have absolutely no concept. So, remember Lot's wife, and we went through some of the scriptures. So, last week, we talked about remembering Lot's wife. That was the, the passage in chapter 1732. Today, we're going to go through coming, the coming kingdom too which is the second half of what I didn't finish. And we'll see how far we get with that. If you remember last week in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. And when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, 
He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation or it doesn't come with scrutiny. It doesn't like a watched pot that never boils. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you, more appropriately among you. Jesus said, I'm here. I'm the king, by the way. And if you're looking for the kingdom, I'm here. Then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the son of man will be in his day. We spoke about Jesus coming again, and it's not secret, it's not quiet, it's not private, it's public, and it's very obvious. But first, he must suffer many things to be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it also will be in the day of the Son of Man. They ate, and they drank, and they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus says, just like Noah, who once he was in a place of safety, God brought judgment down. It will be the same when Jesus comes again. And likewise, as it was destroyed, as, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought and sold, they planted and built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Like Noah, who God spoke in advance that he was going to do something and bring judgment, told him to build an ark and in obedience he did and God delivered him by doing that and then poured down judgment on the people. Just like Lot, who went and was delivered from the city of Sodom. And the angel said, you've got to go because I cannot do anything until you have reached safety. So it will be when the son of man returns. There must be something wrong with me today. This is what we didn't go over last week. This will be the new material. In that day, he was on the housetop and his goods are in the house let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed and one will be taken and the other left. There will be two will be grinding together and one will be taken and the other left. Two will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And so he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. It's a mystery. So, let's take a look. We remember last week, where the angels took Lot out of the town, and he says, it'll be like this when the Son of Man comes. So we're not to be like Lot's wife looking back. It'll be just like that when the Son of Man is revealed. Peter mentions in 2 Peter 2, 4 to 9, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but he cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world on the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example for those who afterwards would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeking and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to, res to reserve the unjust until the punishment for the day of judgment. If God can deliver Noah, if God can deliver Lot, God can deliver you. 
And if he can punish all of those evil people back then, he can certainly punish the evil people of today. Don't lose heart and look around the world and say, oh my goodness, where is God? Because sometimes I feel that way. All you have to do is turn on the news, look at what's going on in the Ukraine, and it's absolutely heartrending. God is still in charge and he's doing something. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, it says here, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or he pretends to be God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I was still with you and I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. You, you know what is restraining God's judgment upon this world right now? The Spirit of God, which dwells in you. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The Spirit of God will be taken out of the way, and then God is able to pour out judgment, just like Noah, just like Lot. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, and that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I said last week, the reason that people don't go to heaven is not because they're sinners, because we're all sinners. It's because they haven't accepted the gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what your sin is. Amen? Amen. So, moving on to something new. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, speaking about the Lord coming again, Paul writing to the Thessalonians, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who have predeceased us, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, and you can see Paul was hoping to be alive at this point, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And here's the strong admonition in verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That the Lord's going to come and take us home. That's got to do something to your heart. That you will not be left here when God pours out his judgment. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11 says this, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you... Brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. You see, he's going to come as a thief in the night to those who don't know him. They'll be surprised. You won't be surprised because you're sitting here listening to Thessalonians. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep. In other words, don't be off guard. Don't get wrapped up in the affairs of this world as others do. But let us watch and be sober. It means be level-headed, not, uh, not inebriated, but it, it has the same effect. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day or of Christ, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. Do you understand that God coming and taking us home because of what Jesus has done should bring great hope and comfort to us. And yet it's not something that I think about on a regular basis. And yet I'm supposed to comfort you guys with these words. You're supposed to comfort me with those words. We're supposed to do that for one another. Remember that Jesus is coming back. So he says, therefore comfort each other and edify one another. You will see a very big difference in this scripture between them and us. There's a separation. And it's very, very clear. Picking it up in verse 31, back to our passage in Luke. In that day, he was on a housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. So what is Jesus trying to say? Because he's talking about believers. He's talking about those, those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, when this happens, don't go into your house. Don't pack a bag. Don't, don't do any of that. Why does he say that? I don't know about you, but like Lot, Lot's wife, she probably just got her kitchen remodeled or something, you know, and you're pulling me out. I just got my kitchen. I got a new dishwasher and everything. I mean, and so she was attached to Sodom. The interesting thing is it, it doesn't say that she turned back like you and I would understand turn back. She turned around and started heading back towards Sodom. She didn't just look over her shoulder to see what was going on and watch the, the, the fireworks. She lagged behind. In fact, she was encouraged by her husband to hurry up. Wives, I'm sure you've heard this before. And she turned around and actually headed towards Sodom, which is a very different thing than just turning around to watch God do his work. That can happen to us if we get too attached to this world, right? What the scripture is telling us is that we need to loose the lure of luxury. You know, the, the most important thing is that I have everything I want principle, that I get everything I want that I eat every food. Uh, what do you feel like eating today for lunch? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, appetites can have such a very strong hold on us and a strong pull on us. And the scripture saying, don't get attached to your stuff because when the Lord goes to take you home, you're not going to want to take any of it with you anyway, right? New kitchen withstanding, you know, you, you won't want to you won't want to stick around. So we need to be loosed from this necessity that we have everything that we want and we get everything we desire. Also, don't lag, linger, or look. I hope you appreciate all the L's I put in here because <laughs> I really work hard on this. Don't lag, linger, or look. In fact, Jesus says in another place, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. If you start this thing and you're going you're gonna to do the work that the Lord calls you to do, don't turn back around and say, oh, remember how good it was? You know, let me take a look. You know, you can imagine Lot's wife, you know, taking a selfie. Oh, you know, wanting to get in the picture. And we're told to remember Lot's wife for that very reason. Whenever I read about Lot's wife and she turns into a pillar of salt, it always reminds me of Medusa. I don't know if you, you know the, the fable of, of Medusa. And she was a beautiful woman. She was cursed. With, anyway, it just reminds me of that. I just thought I'd mention it. Learn the lesson from Lot's lady. It's not easy to do, guys. It's not as corny as patio furniture. 
<laughs> Learn a lesson from Lot's lady. Don't, don't turn back around and look at the glory days. There, there are things that I kept when I was young in, in the faith that used to remind me of the glory days and the times when I would, you know, I'd be out with the boys and we'd party and we'd do these things and, you know. I had to get rid of them all. I had pictures of old girlfriends until my wife found them. We tend to hold on to trophies because we remember those things, and yet I also understand that those things are like serpents waiting to come and bite me. So there are things that we need to loose. Um, I know people that when they, they, used, they used to be something when they were young, you know, and they won all these trophies, and they still have these trophies on shelves loaded with dust from 35 years ago. I had different kind of trophies, but I had to get rid of all that junk because I realized that I don't want to be like Lot's lady. I don't want to be like Lot's wife. I want to leave it all behind. I don't want to turn around. And by the way, this edifice right here that you see over in the area of Israel is called Lot's wife. And it is a pillar of salt on the plain overlooking where Sodom was. It's said actually by three um, writers, one of them is Josephus, that you could actually discern body parts in all of this when you would go by and see it. Um, it's eroded considerably since then. But I just find it very interesting that if you really want proof that the scriptures are true, all you have to do is go look because it's right there. It, you won't see it on the news though. In Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 to 22, it talks about those who will have to go through the great tribulation. And there's always the question of, does the church go through the great tribulation? And some people are pre-tribulationists with believes that the Lord's going to take us home before any of the tribulation happens. Some people are mid-tribulationists, believes we're going to go through some of the tribulation. And then some people believe that we're going to go all the way to the very end. We're going to go through everything that God's going to pour out on this world. And we will be at the end. I guess it depends on where your relationship with Christ is. At least that's the way I see it. For the church of Thyatira, the spirit writes to John, is telling John to speak. Jesus himself is dictating to, to him after uh, his resurrection. And he says, to the angel of the church of Thyatira. Now this is written to a church. These things says the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, faith, service, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things that are sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Now, if you're a Bible scholar or if you've been in Christ for a while, you recognize the great tribulation part. It's mentioned three times in the Bible. This is one of them in the book of Revelation. The other one is in Matthew 24, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. This is the great tribulation, God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And he's warning a church that if they don't straighten out, they're going to go through it. That's a little scary. I don't know about you, but I want to be on the first bus. So, will Christians go through the Great Tribulation? There will be people converted in the Great Tribulation. There'll be 144,000 Jews who will be evangelists that share the gospel. There'll be those who see the one whom they pierced and they'll weep. There are people who will come to Christ after the rapture. So, yes, there will be Christians in the Tribulation, but I don't believe they're, they're, they got on the right bus. They didn't get on the first bus. And the third time that the Great Tribulation is mentioned is Revelation chapter 7. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, 
Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? This is a picture of what's going on in heaven. And I said to him, sir, you know, that's a good answer, right? When an elder from heaven asks you, say, hey, who are these people? And you don't know, it's best to say, I don't know. But you do. You ever have somebody ask you a question they already know the answer to? That's what this is. And it's so that it all gets written down, which is, I'm glad for it. So, where did these come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. And so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So there's testimony that there will be people who come to Jesus Christ only after we're gone. Because that would be a pretty convincing truth, wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. Hey, this person that preached the gospel to me all the time, they're gone. Poof. I always have this thought, you know, that one day I'll wake up, my wife will be gone, and I'll be left behind. I, I know of somebody that actually had that very occurrence happen, and they thought their husband was gone. And they looked everywhere for him, couldn't find him. Finally, he was sitting in a chair, kind of reclined back because he had a little bit of uh, reflux trying to sleep. She thought the rapture had happened, she got left behind. Because the scripture says there'll be two and one will be taken. I tell you in that night there will be two men. By the way, the word man is injected there. It's not in the original manuscript. Because two men in a bed is a little weird. <laughs> by the way, it's not in the original manuscript. That's why you find it in parentheses. So that's why I didn't read it when I initially read it. Because it's not in the original. At night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Meaning the disciples asked him. And so he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Isn't that a mysterious phrase? It's great think my job is easy, right? Mm -hmm. There'll be two together in bed and one will be taken and one will be left. Can you imagine the tragedy of having a loved one go to be with the Lord and you didn't get on the bus? There'll be two together grinding in a mill and one will be taken and one will be left. There'll be two in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. By the way, I want you to recognize that in the scenario number one, it's dark. It's nighttime when people sleep. Day two, when you're grinding, that's at the end of the day when you've taken in your fill. And then the third one, the ones in the field, that's the morning. Jesus just said exactly when he's going to come. Somewhere it will be night. Somewhere it'll be afternoon and somewhere it'll be morning. The scripture teaches that the world is round. Did you know that? that there's light and darkness all going on at the same time. That's why the Lord didn't leave us with time because, you know, it's always 12 o'clock somewhere, right? Anyway. This is a global event, and because the world is round, Jesus describes this, and there's going to be nighttime, there's going to be afternoon, and there's morning. All of this is going on, and when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a separation. There'll be one that's taken and one that's not. And I don't know about you, but that, that makes me think, who do I want to leave behind? Nobody. So who should I be telling the gospel to? Everybody. In Matthew chapter 25, I won't read it to you. You know the passage. It's where Jesus separates the, the sheep from the goats. And the thing is that there is a separation between those are, that are his and those that are not. And God separates one from another. The people that you don't want to be separated from, make sure you share the gospel with. Because I don't, I don't want to be separated. Tell them that their sin can be forgiven, their life can be changed. They can be born again. They can be a new creature where all things are, are gone and the new things have come. And without that, we're going to have to stand in judgment for all the things that we've done in the body. Now, those of you who are a little more sensitive 
uh, to your own failings, you'll understand that there's no way you're going to stand before the Lord and give an account for the things that you've done in the body. There's not enough good in the world to undo all the bad we've done, all the junk in our minds and that our heart has been set upon, all the selfish deeds that we've done, the things that we haven't done that we've avoided, um, all of that. There'll be a separation. And those that are the goats that he puts on his right, and he puts on his left, he'll say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. And it's a never knowing you. So just like Noah, just like Lot, this last verse is rather peculiar because one will be taken and one will be left. And then they say, where, Lord? That seems like a strange question, doesn't it? Where are they taken or where are they left? And so he said to them, wherever the body is, the eagles will be gathered together in Matthew 24. When Matthew records it, he words it slightly differently. For whoever, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. He's talking about a dead body. You know, wherever there's a dead body, you're going to see, you'll, you'll see the birds circling. And uh, it's, it's kind of conjecture whether this is really eagles or whether this is carrion birds like vultures, uh, which look a lot like eagles. And um, if you're not trained, you'll look up in the sky, you won't know what you're looking at. Is that a, is that a turkey vulture? Or, until you see all that red floppy weirdness on their face, uh, you don't know what it is. They tend to gather where the dead bodies are. So what is Jesus trying to say here? Where the bodies fall and where there's judgment, where, when this world is ripe for judgment, you'll begin to see the bird circle. You guys will know. You'll know exactly what's going on. It won't be a secret. Make sense? Now, getting, getting back, just a point of argument, because he loved to argue with me when I'm up here. That comes later. Some people believe that there are those who are taken and they're taken to judgment. And that those who are left begin the millennial kingdom. There are some that there are those who are taken and they're raptured up. And, and brought to be with the Lord. And when he refers to the dead bodies, he's talking about those who are left behind for judgment. You guys can argue about that over some food a little later. I'm really not going to tell you. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 and following is now say, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, it'd be nice to go to heaven just like this without any pain of death or change, but that's not going to happen. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. He's speaking of believers. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, then mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're encouraged by the scriptures to continue doing what we're doing. And we don't do it to be saved. We do it because we're saved. And because we have this great hope. Amen? Amen. So that's all I had, but I didn't think it would take all our time. So I moved on. <laughs> Chapter 18, verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought to pray, always to pray, and not lose heart saying, there was a certain judge, in a city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. 
Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said to himself, though I do not fear God or regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? It's a rather sobering picture. Jesus tells us a story about a judge and a widow. I like in the very beginning because he speaks a parable, which is a, a story that comes alongside a truth to teach a truth that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. I love when the Bible tells us exactly why Jesus is telling the story, because there's no question as to how to interpret it, right? He says, this is why Jesus told this story, so that people would always pray and not faint, and they would be faithful to do so. There's a purpose statement for this little story, which helps me to understand it very simply and makes my job very easy. We should always pray, and we should stay strong in our prayers, because God doesn't listen or we don't believe God has answered our prayers up to this point in time, doesn't mean that he won't. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't want to. And sometimes we get, we get a version in our mind that God is like our earthly father. Any of you have that problem? I, th I think God doesn't, you know, give a rip about me. He's got other stuff going on and, you know, and no, no, that's my earthly father. My heavenly father, on the other hand, he says that he, he looks at me all the time. The purpose statement, always pray and stay strong. Don't faint and lose heart. And by the way, when you have a burden, when you have a difficulty, when you have a hardship in your life, when you have a challenge, those are your choices. You can carry it yourself and faint, <laughs> grow weak, or you can pray about it and trust the Lord. It's always those two choices. So here's the uh, judge. Even though the story says it's a man judge, I, I always think of Judge Judy when I think of an angry judge. I don't know why. So here's this judge, and a widow is going to come up to her and say, hey, I, I need justice. And she's going to say what, like I've heard her say many times, I don't care. And so we have a judge who doesn't care. No love for God, no love for others. When Jesus was asked what the most important commandments are, he says, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting. This judge doesn't have any of it. So Jesus describes her as being perfectly devoid of any morality. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while. Any of you recognize the lady on the left? Where's the beef? That's where she's from. Wendy's commercial. But she's the widow, at least I, in my mind, that's the way. See, when I read these stories, I put personalities to it, and then I remember them. <laughs> I, I got a problem. There, where's the beef? It brings it to judge, and the judge says no, and would not for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, it's interesting the judge understands that, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So the judge said, okay, I'll do it. Why does the judge listen to her? Because I hate nagging. I hate 
nagging, and I, uh, you're going to wear me out with all your nagging. You, you, nagging does, do you guys know nag, nagging? Is that a word? Yeah. Do you guys understand nagging? Yeah. Nagging? You don't, have, you don't ever nag, I'm sure. That's <laughs> terrible. You might remind someone emphatically, repeatedly, but you don't <laughs> nag, I'm sure. It's funny how words can change. Th- anyway, this judge said, you're going to wear me out, so I'm just going to do what you say because you're wearing me out. And that's the way people think God is. I'm going to wear God out. I'm going to pray and pray and pray, and he's going to do what I tell him to, or I'm going to nag him. You think God is frustrated or upset by your nagging? You think he's like a man? You think he's like me? No, it's not like that at all. Jesus is going to bring it home. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Jesus is contrasting the angry godless judge with Jesus. And they're not the same at all although people think that they behave the same. Do you think that God will answer you when you pray? The scripture says yes. I think our problem is we don't, we don't seek God for what to pray for, and we pray for stupid things. Like my back's hurting right now. Is that, a, is that something I should pray about? I should pray about everything. My car needs a car wash. Pray that God brings rain (laughs) with soap. (laughs) We tend to pray really bizarre things, and if if you flip through the television channels and the Christian's cable, you'll you'll find them. And yet, There are things we should be praying for. I hope you're praying for the Ukraine every single day. I hope you're praying for Putin every single day. Either God judge him or God take him out or God save him. I hope you guys are praying instead of bearing that burden because I've struggled with all of that. What do I do? You know, do I grab a gun and fly to the Ukraine? You know what do I? Sometimes I feel like I want to do that. Our Heavenly Father loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. Romans tells us, how will he not, along with all these things, uh, along with Christ, give us all other things? That's the love of God for us. And all we have to do is ask him. And if we ask amiss, like a child, like ask daddy to play with the, the sharp knife, he'll let you know. So we can pray to our Heavenly Father. A couple of interesting things. Jesus is talking about praying for his kingdom to come, I think, because it's right on the heels of the rapture. He's talking about praying for that. In 2 Peter 3, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, it says, Beloved, now I write to you the second epistle, in both of which stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. You see, he's not nagging that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers or our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing, nothing's changed. Where's God? For this they willfully forget, that the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded by water. So God created the earth, and it was completely covered with water, and then he made land appear, which came up out of the water, And then what did he do to reverse the process? He flooded the earth and everything went back underwater. 
by the way, God did that. There's evidence of it geologically throughout the entire earth. It's very easily seen. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, God's word, are reserved for fire. By the way, God promised he would never destroy the earth with water again. But fire is going to be the destruction of this world until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day. In other words, don't think he's going to work on your calendar. His calendar doesn't have, you know, months and days and years. What it has is levels of evil. And that's his calendar. It's more of a barometer. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter is giving us a breakdown on how everything is going to cut loose on this earth and how everything is going to be judged by fire. It sounds like a nuclear issue, doesn't it? I am not surprised. When things begin to happen, it's the only way they're going to be able to put on immortality is to put off this mortal. And it'll be by one way or the other. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he has died for your sins and he will preserve you, not because of anything you've done, not because you've earned it, but because you received a free gift. Amen? Amen. One of the last verses in the book of the Bible, in fact, the last verse says in the Bible, he who testifies of these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Seemed an apt way to end our time together. That the Lord is coming back. Are you ready? I don't want anyone in this church to be like those in the church of Thyatira, that if they don't repent and get their act together, it's not a religious observance that we have. It's a relationship with the creator. And if you don't have that today, I want to offer you the opportunity. I want to introduce you to a savior if you don't know him. Talk to me after the service if you want to know how to have a relationship with God. And I'd be glad to lead you or Carl or any of the fine men that are here uh, that are deacons or the ladies that are here will be able to point you to Jesus and help you with that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I pray that the Lord bless you guys today. Mm -hmm.